Hey guys, it's Libby, and today I'm doing my February wrap up. In February, I read four plays, one audiobook, and one manual? We'll talk about it. The first three plays that I read were all by William Shakespeare. The fourth play that I read was also by William Shakespeare, but I finished that last, so we'll save that till the end. So I read um, Henry the Fourth, parts one and two, and Henry the Fifth. I just read these back in like September, maybe August, um, so I'm not going to talk about them too much in depth. Now I will leave a link to that video um, so you can get more of my thoughts. Uh, this time when I read these plays, I only read the good parts. So I had a much more positive experience when you just like cut all the boring Falstaff bits. Then I finished an audiobook that I've been working on for several weeks, which was Belinda by Mariah Edgeworth. Published in 1801, the year after, um, I've already forgotten what it's called. Castle Rack Rent, uh, which was another Mariah Edgeworth that I read last month. And it is quite different than Castle Rack Rent, but it is not particularly better. Well, it's a little bit better. Castle Rack Rent was a fairly short political novel. Um, Belinda is a sort of long, medium to long um, novel of the marriage game. So our supposed heroine, Belinda, um, is an orphan. Duh. She has an aunt who is her guardian, but she doesn't live with her aunt. Her aunt has sent her to live with Lady Delacour to be sort of educated and to get like high-ranking connections so that she can make a high-ranking match. Now one of the numerous problems with this book is that Belinda is a terrible main character. She kind of has no character traits. She's just nice. She's a nice girl does nice things. And I think you would be forgiven for not realizing that Belinda was the main character because the first sort of two thirds is much more focused on Lady Delacour. Um, and then the last third is like a hodgepodge of like some other characters. This book was about some things that should theoretically be interesting. Lady Delacour, when she's not doing her like sniping at other society ladies thing, which she does a fair bit of, um, is like, she has, she has breast cancer, or at least she thinks she has breast cancer, and she doesn't want anybody else to know because she has lots of enemies and she's afraid that like, if she exposes that she has this humiliating disease, um, uh, people will like use that to deride her. She thinks that she got this breast cancer from the backfire of a musket because she uh, was in a duel. She and another lady like dressed up in men's clothes and had a duel at dawn with guns at some point. If this had happened in a historical fiction book, I would have been like, no, uh, -uh that's silly. But it actually happened in an early modern book. So interesting. And Lady Delacour and Lord Delacour don't get along super well. So like she doesn't want him to know that she has breast cancer. And so she does all these secretive things. Uh, which means he thinks that she's having an affair, and then Lady Delacour gets jealous because Belinda, who is just such a nice person, is being nice to Lord Delacour, and she's like, when I die of breast cancer, Belinda is going to steal my husband. And then eventually we sort of get introduced to Belinda's two main love interest potentials. She has like a couple other ones who dip in and out, but they're not important and I've already forgotten about them because very few characters in this book are memorable at all. The first one is Clarence Hervey, who is obviously the man that she is going to choose. And then her other romantic option is Mr. Vincent, who is a very interesting character because he is a Creole. Now, this book is presented as discussing interracial marriage, which like for 1801 was out there man. But I'm actually not totally sure that it does. I genuinely do not know what Mr. Vincent's race is. So the text describes him as a Creole, which in English, the way it's most commonly used as far as I'm aware, is a person with one parent who was European and one parent who was African. But that's not what the word Creole means in Spanish. It just means a person of solely European descent who's living in the Americas. And his skin color and his race are never brought up aside from his initial introduction, which I feel like they would be if he was actually of African descent because there is another um, African character in this book named Juba. He's a servant of Mr. Vincent's and he is referred to by his skin color all of the time. They just call him the black a lot. He is spoken of condescendingly by both the other characters in the book and the narrator. 
And when you're reading those parts, you are fully aware that you are not reading a book by someone who is woke. And so I am kind of surprised that this book would portray two men of color in so different a light. But he is described as Creole, so if you know more about early 19th century race and colonial politics than me, please educate me. I am pretty sure that the version I listened to was a revised manuscript published I think in 1808, and I know that uh, Mariah Edgeworth's father made her um, edit some of the race content or the initial publication. So maybe it's more clear in the 1801 manuscript. So Belinda, the novel, does talk about all of these potentially interesting things and I felt like I should have liked it, but the just arthurial voice and the style had not fully developed. Jane Austen had not graced us with her genius yet and it shows. The characters are all pretty one-dimensional, the main character especially so. There is absolutely zero irony, and the tone of the narration is completely flat. So the narrative doesn't like pique your interest or set up expectations which are then like happily fulfilled or hilariously reversed at any point. So I gave Belinda three stars? Being generous? I think it's like a 2.5? I don't know. I'm gonna read more 18th century literature, I'm gonna keep plugging, and I've mainly, at this point I feel like the reason I'm reading 18th century literature is so that I can more perfectly describe why I don't like 18th century literature. Anyway, the next thing I read was that manual I mentioned. It is The Medieval Tailor's Assistant, Common Garments 1100 to 1480 by Sarah Thursfield. So if you don't know, I sew historical costumes and I've recently gotten really into the 14th century, the late 14th century. Um, and so I wanted to make some stuff from then, but I've only ever done 19th and 20th century costuming before. So I felt like I wanted to read like the entirety of a book about sewing from that period. Um, I do have lots of sewing books. They're not on my shelves, they're in the other room. Um, and I never really like go through and like read the whole thing. I just use them as reference books. Um, but since I had never done anything like this before, um, I decided to just read the whole thing. I did skim the parts about men's clothing. If you want to know more about my costumes, you can follow me on Instagram. Um, I pretty much just post about costumes. It's not a, it's not a bookstagram thing. Um, it has been neglected of late because I didn't do a lot of sewing during the move to Amsterdam, but um, I'm gonna start posting again now that I'm sewing again. Um, so I have, I will show you one thing that I've made. I've made a wimple, which is literally just a rectangle, but you wear it. Wear it like this. Styling. And then the final thing that I read, that last Shakespeare play, was Henry VIII. So I have now finished the first folio texts, and I just have to read Two Noble Kinsmen and Edward III until I am done with what I personally consider to be the complete works of William Shakespeare. Um, this is a history play that is not often read or performed, and there is a good reason for that. This was a collaboration between Shakespeare and John Fletcher. Um, they sort of equally contributed various scenes, and you can tell. This tells the oft-told story of Henry VIII's divorce from his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, and his marriage to Anne Boleyn. And there's lots of, like, juicy stuff here that people can make use of in all sorts of ways, and yet this play still managed to be super boring. Part of that, I think, is the fault of the collaboration. It's not like Shakespeare wrote all of Acts 1 and 2 and Fletcher wrote Acts 3, 4, and 5 or anything. Like, Fletcher wrote the first two scenes and then Shakespeare wrote the last scene of Act 1 and then did just, it, it, it's quite a jumble. So you don't really, like, build up a flow. Like, each scene is rather isolated. It doesn't feel like any of the things that have happened before that scene matter. Fletcher is also not as good of a writer as Shakespeare, so a lot of the lines I'm just like, uh, this is merely conveying plots and like not doing anything interesting with language, and I have read history books, so I already know the plot. I think Shakespeare and Fletcher also had sort of conflicting attitudes on Cardinal Wolsey. Um, Shakespeare in the scenes he wrote seems to be like trying to make Wolsey the villain, um, whereas Fletcher is a bit more sympathetic to him. Henry VIII, the title character, is barely in it. The first half, it seems like it's mainly the story of Cardinal Wolsey, and I'm like, okay, that's interesting. But then Wolsey is like, 
dead by a little over halfway through and it's just sort of a jumble. And there's also a lot of the story that we don't actually see, like scenes happen, like the coronation of Anne Boleyn and that sort of stuff, um, that we don't actually get to see. We just have characters telling other characters about it afterwards, and that can be done in an interesting way. It is in Charlie and Cressida. It is not done that way here. There is basically one scene that is worth reading, and here it is Act 2, Scene 4, um, which was one of the ones written by Shakespeare, no surprise, and it's where Catherine makes a petition to Henry um, for like all the reasons that he should not divorce her. So now that I've read all of the more obscure history plays, um, I've decided King John is actually quite good and you should read it and people should perform it. It is undeservedly maligned. Um, the Henry VI plays were some of Shakespeare's super early works, so you can kind of be a little baby bard. Um, and they are uh, too long and a bit scattered, but you will occasionally see like flashes of genius in um, Henry, King Henry VI speeches and in Richard, Duke of Gloucester's speeches. Um, you'll sometimes get something good. And then Henry VIII is actually bad. I gave it two stars. And now you may have noticed that I didn't actually read any novels this month. Um, uh, I feel like I spent a lot of my time reading novels. Uh, I just didn't actually get to finish any. So one of the ones I'm reading is The Meaning of Night, um, which I've read a whole bunch of times before, but not since joining booktube. Um, and it's 700 pages, which I feel like is longer than I remember it being. So it's taking me more time to get through than I recall. Um, and then the other book that I'm reading is Little Big by John Crowley. I am on page 51. And I feel like I have already read an entire novel. This is very literary. It's very slow going. Fingers crossed it's gonna pay off. So hopefully I'll be able to talk to you guys about these two next month. That's upside down. Uh, Meaning of Night, I'm confident I'll be done with. A little big, this may be a multi-month book. But thank you very much for watching. I'll see you guys again soon.